Thank you very much. Good morning, fellows. Good morning, fellows. Good morning. I need, I need energy. You are, you are youth. Good morning, fellows. Good morning. Good morning. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. And my fellow um, presenters, panelists, it's such a pleasure this morning to be amongst the youth. Um, I'm so delighted. As you have heard, my name is Duonke, and I'm Head of Business Development, Grants Management and Communications in actually Malawi. It's such a mouthful and a very heavy <laughs> position, to be honest with you. But I think growing up, I learned one thing. The one thing that I learned is that there is always space. But it doesn't come easy. You have to play that space. You have to, when you get to that space, you have to do your part, and you have you need to have your own motivation. Things will go positive. There will be times that things will be hard, but just the fact that you're on that space and you have played that space is is, is strong enough to motivate others. When I go in rooms like this. And I just mentioned that I'm, I'm head of business development. Already, I'm sure there's always one person who maybe when she woke up, she was doubting herself to say, am I worth it? What can I do? But the moment I introduce myself, you know, I believe someone sits and say, I can do this. Yeah. And I believe there's so many of us in this room who are saying, I can do it. Um, you know, when I was researching, I learned that Malawi ranks 168 out of 175 in terms of ICT. Can you believe that? What does that tell you? It tells you that number one, we are limited in terms of access to information. Number two, it tells you we are limited in terms of access to opportunities. Number three, it tells you that we have limitations in terms of showcasing our skills and talents. Number four, it tells you that the, the role of the youth in influencing is so limited. And when you also look at the rates of unemployment, they're very high. I read on the document we're talking about 7.1%. These are just figures. But if you ask me, we should be in about 25% or even more. Amongst the youth, yes. Dr. Mary Shaw says 80%. I agree. Because if you just go outside of this hotel, for sure you meet 9 out of 10 youth who are just walking endlessly, loitering around. If you go in the Laris, trust you me, 9 out of 10% of those youth, they have nothing to do. And I come in this room and in this space and I say, wow, imagine if government would do this in all the 28 districts, you know, having even in a year four cohorts, what impact would that make? We will reduce and, and with that effort we will be able to reduce the level of unemployment and we will give the space for the youth to nurture their potential talents. The other thing that I think government can do is if you look at um, uh, the rate of unemployment vis-a-vis -vis issues of financing towards the youth, you see that in terms of the trends, in terms of financing uh, youth, and when I talk about the youth, I'm talking about um, uh, the, the youthful age where you can work, you can be involved in, 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 in a sort of work. The investment is very low compared to other countries. 
And as the youth, we need to lobby that, to say government has to increase its investment to the youth. We cannot talk about access to education, and the COVID has told us a lot. We were talking about accessing education via online platform. But, and everyone asked, how do we reach someone in Tariri who does not have a phone, who does not have a laptop? The cost of even putting airtime in your phone, it's even harder for even people like us who are working. <laughs> so imagine that girl in Tariri, that girl in Sati, in Fatima, who has just finished from home, or who is, who is, who is in secondary school, and we're talking about access to education. That is difficult in itself. So as government, we need to increase, I mean, we need to lobby that government increases the investment that is made on the youth. The other thing is tax incentives. We have a um, uh, uh, private sector that is heavily taxed. And the private sector that is providing ICT, for example, we are talking about um, uh, Airtel, TNA, and other platforms. In Malawi, the cost of, of buying bundles or internet is very high. It's extremely high. Why is it so? Because those companies are also taxed. So we bear the brunt of that tax. And every opportunity now, you need to access it via internet. And you can't access internet. So if we are to lobby that government reduces or gives tax incentives to these uh, organizations, to these companies, to these institutions, or even if they cannot give the incentives, government can subsidize. You know? If we, we can say how many youth are in secondary school and how many, if, if we are to have the digital platforms, how much would they need to actually have a 20 GB bundle? Yeah? For a start. And, we, and government can subsidize that. And even the root of tax incentive, it can go a long way to make sure that the cost of accessing uh, internet is quite low. The other thing that uh, government can do is to introduce innovation funds. I tell you, in Malawi, there is so much talent. There is so much potential. You have seen the video on the boy who harnessed the wind. I'm telling you, if well wishers had not supported him, he would have been in the village doing nothing, and maybe the unfortunate part, maybe using a home. The other thing that is also important is issues of curriculum. I will tell you what, our curriculum is so outdated. <laughs> For me, the first time I saw a computer, and I touched a computer was when I was in Hong Kong. Wow. I was lucky, <laughs> because then they had introduced Science and technology. We were the first cohort. I tell you, I was shaking and trembling. But I was, as you're saying, I was lucky because there is someone, there is my grandma in the village who has not even touched a computer. There are some people who have not even been able to see what Google is and they don't know what Google is. And that is the reality. And because our curriculum is so outdated, we are taught now the parts of a grasshopper. We are still taught the parts of a grasshopper. We are still taught the parts of a leaf and flower. Those are basic things that we shouldn't take time on. We should learn from what others are doing. You know, in, in, in nursery school, they have already introduced them to phones. They have already introduced them to technology. When they reach primary school, they can assemble a, a phone. They can play around. Some, but by standard eight, 
they can do an app. But how many of us in here, including myself, Dr. Marisha, I will mention you. <laughs> visit some PSS offices, there is a computer, but observe, it's covered, <laughs> and it has never been touched. They will move out of that office without touching. When it's not there, they will complain, oh, my office has no computer, oh, it has no pain. And when they see you using the computer, the question is, where did you learn? How did you learn? How did you That's a reality. And we need to, you know, push and lobby so that our curriculum is not just centered on learning or knowing information that is so basic and useless, but on giving us information that is useful, that will teach us skills. Skills for us to compete in the very competitive labor market. The labor market today is very competitive. Even if you go at the most basic level of employment, they'll ask you, do you know Microsoft? And if you don't know Microsoft, already you are out. And you can't compete. So our curriculum has to really be improved and to make sure that it impacts either the skills, the knowledge, that we need for us to compete. Myself here, I cannot maybe compete with a standard five in China. I cannot. But they are, they, they are so advanced such that they compete. You go in meetings at international forums, the way our friends articulate issues, they have information at their fingertips. Why? It's because they have information, they have access to that information. The other thing that I, a government can also do is to provide people of best practices. You know, in Malawi, we profound corruption. There was a few days ago, someone who posted a picture of a former, a former, former cabinet minister, and people said, now look at him, he's so poor. He has nothing, you know, it was on social media. And then someone said, look, what if the guy was honest? And if you look at the salaries, it's not something that would, you know, make him, you know. Actually, the majority of us, uh, we are where we are. <laughs> because we didn't be you know, people. Mm -hmm. And for your information, eh, sorry to interrupt you. When I was in the revolution in HIV and AIDS, I was told point blank, you must have a bodyguard with the gun because we are going to shoot you. I said, why? They told me, oh, you are not allowing us to eat the money because the first block of the money was eaten just like that. And you cleared the thing, now the money is coming, you don't want people to eat. Who shoot you? So I said, mm -hmm. I have my bodyguard. They asked me where, I said, yes. <laughs> Who doesn't sleep? And he sees me every day. Then they decided to make things through Jude. But with my God, the Jude did not do. The aim was I should be on a wheelchair, be kicked out of the office, and then they can continue eating the money. But the IPM, I'm very rich. My richness is Thank you. Can we clap hands? <laughs> People like Dr. Mary Shaw, who have been in government, who have shown a great example in the youth. But we all admire those people who have stolen money. They are driving push cars. Hmm? Ah, he's doing very well. No. And as government, and as civil society, and as stakeholders, we need to profound such people who are an example to the youth. 
The last thing that I wanted us to, 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 to look at is the issue of ICT quotas. You know, I remember 2016 or 2017, there was a huge investment that was made by World Bank for government of Malawi to have in each district an ICT quota. I don't know where we are now. I don't know where the computers are. I haven't seen them. But the money was spent. I, I, I can't say <laughs> that the money was awarded to the government of Malawi. If, for example, we would have those ICT quotas, where someone can just go and access the computer, can access the internet, we put um, applications that are very useful, that will give the skills that the youth need, I'm sure would have made a huge impact. In other countries, they are there. You can actually access other access. But our friends in Thailand, they, can, they don't know if our own government has, there is a vacancy in government or in, in, in civil society. They can't access that. But if we would have those ICT quotas, people would be able to access some information. They would learn the skills, they would have information, they would be able to profile their work. So as government, I mean, as, as fellows here, that's also an advocacy issue. We need to follow up on. And we need to lobby and engage government. You know, gone are the days when advocacy was just made by a print a newspaper. Those days are gone. You see the president of the US, his diplomacy is where? Where is his diplomacy? It's actually now, it's Twitter diplomacy. But, but you see, when, when, when he started talking on Twitter, everyone was saying, how on earth can the whole US president award Twitter? But now, all the presidents, where are they moving to? Twitter. The, 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 the playing field has changed. Things have changed, and we need to move in times. Our government has to change. Some of the websites for government are so outdated. You are looking for a policy, you can't find it. <laughs> the information that is, in, is, is put there, sometimes not verified. And even if there is information there, it's not readable. You can't read it. You can't make sense out of it. It's time government wakes up. It's time civil society wakes up. It's time stakeholders work because information is so important. Information is power. Let me end by saying this, that from today, six months down the line, you will not be the same. Two years down the line, you will not be the same. Three years, five years down the line, you will be the people in position. You are already now in positions of power. But claim the space. Fight for the space. And tell yourself when you wake up over and over again that I am capable, that I am able, and I am here to change. You can do it. I can do it. Change does not start when you're 60. Change starts now. Can we all say that? Change starts now? Can you say it like a minute? Change starts now. And change starts with me. And change starts with me. Thank you very much, Tanya, for having me. So thank you so much for making your time to be with us. I'm feeling hungry, I know you guys are too, so we're just going to have our last speaker. This is Adrian Komasomba. He's around our age groups, so think of him as a peer. <laughs>